Go for it, Pike. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Center for Personalized Medicine seminar with Professor Richard Carlson Linner from Leiden University. Uh, the CPM is a partnership between the University of Oxford uh, Welcome Center for Human Genetics and St. Anne's College in Oxford. It is a communication and engagement vehicle to explore the benefits and challenges of personalized medicine. And we're therefore really pleased to welcome Richard to give his talk on genetic risk scores and their possible insurance implications. Uh, Richard is an economist who specializes in social science genetics, and his recent work investigates the economic consequences of genomic medicine and consumer genetic testing for various markets, including those for healthcare and for insurance. Uh, we're really excited to hear about this cross-cutting social science research, so I'll hand over to you now, Richard, and thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Patrick. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. And uh, hello, everyone. Ray, can you confirm that you see the screen all right? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Go ahead. Great. And you don't see the Zoom bar here in the, that I see? Uh, no, no, we're all set. Uh, great. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm delighted to be here and be able to present some of my recent work. Um, this is a paper that I've written together with uh, uh, Professor Philip Kullinger, uh, my previous PhD supervisor and uh, now a colleague, and um, I'm happy to tell you that it's conditionally accepted into the Journal of Health Economics, so it's almost almost out in the published domain. So, so now I'm happy to to advertise the paper a little bit. And as many of you are probably aware of, there's currently an ongoing personal genomics revolution, where plenty of companies and services are offering genetic testing of different forms to the public. And in some cases, this falls under uh, laws of medical devices, for example, some of 23andMe's genetic testing for, uh, for breast cancer and Alzheimer's. Um, but most of this testing is, is what I would like to call currently in a state of a wild west. There is a mixture of uh, ways of communicating these findings there's a huge variation in the quality of these tests, how many genetic variants or the quality of the underlying genetic studies that are used to generate these risk assessments. And uh, other complications for the public include whether a test is just based on genotyping, genotyping and imputation, or as in the left uh, bottom panel here with a company that's called Circle DNA that actually now starts offering also exome sequencing and risk prediction based on that to the public. Um, and in the right-hand panel, I've marked specifically that circle uh, beyond generating health reports um, for medical conditions such as cardiovascular disease or breast cancer, now also gives an overall estimate of the chance of living long, which is, which is the, uh, the general outcome. Uh, uh, under discussion in this presentation. Um, so overall, that we can early in life reveal genetic risks for common medical conditions and mortality risks of uh, many different kinds is really becoming a reality. And the accuracy of these tests is increasing rapidly. And the price is falling as well. So in many cases now, you can get genotyping and imputation at less than 100 euros. Uh, sometimes when there are sales, you can get them for less than 50. Um, and once you have gotten yourself genotyped in such a way, there's a, a, a large number of uh, secondary DNA interpretation sites that allow a user also to kind of bypass the original service and retrieve more information than was originally sold under, under the, the first set of agreements. And exome sequencing is somewhat more expensive, but also uh, relative to genotyping is now becoming really cheap at, a, at roughly starting at 300 euros um, for an exome sequencing. And this has led to a market growth in the market for consumer genetic services. So there's a st steady stream of new companies 
if you would Google DNA analysis or, or get, get your DNA test now, there, there are so many new names that I've been tracking these for, for the last five years or so, but there are so many new companies that I cannot fully have an overview of them all. And after searching on their websites and having a look, look at their example reports, there are also many of these services that I, I would consider to be of questionable quality. Um, based on my own anecdotal evidence, I could, could argue that some are really, uh, really so um, post box companies driven by one or a few individuals. Um, um, and, and don't have the, the normal requirements that surround a medical testing lab of different kinds. Um, nonetheless, uh, people are obviously very eager uh, for exploring their DNA for health information and for genealogical information. And the latest uh, citation number I had was, is a few years old, but already in 2018, more than 10 million people around the world uh, were customers of, of uh, consumer genetics companies. And that doesn't include all the uh, people uh, genetically tested for, for scientific purposes who have, who have been kind enough to donate their DNA for science. And I would suspect that this, this number has grown considerably since 2018 as well. Uh, in my view as an economist, revealing health risks and other kinds of health information early in life has a multitude of economic consequences. And we're just in the, in the very first steps of, of mapping what these consequences are and, and, and how people actually react and change their behavior to receiving uh, what could perhaps have been previously unknown information to them. Some of this information could have been observed maybe through family history or, or was already available through, through uh, their medical history and so, but, may, but I could see that many are also uh, unknown. And it's also unknown uh, how people react in difference to uh, very accurate tests, say a diagnostic test for, for a rare disorder compared to the much lower accuracy of, of predictive genetic tests. Uh, but but some, some behavioral changes that I foresee is of course that, that people might want to change their insurance behavior. Uh, they might get a life insurance if they have high risk, they might end a life insurance, terminate a life insurance contract if they uh, believe they are a particularly low risk. And it, it, uh, similar reasoning applies to annuities, pensions, uh, optimal consum uh, consumption over the life cycle, uh, what to invest in, when to take out those savings and, and use them. So the topic of my study here uh, is that we have focused specifically on life insurance. And we do that for a couple of reasons. Um, the basics of, of life insurance to begin with is that it pro provides economic benefit uh, to a beneficiary upon the death of the insured. And so it does not really provide the, the most fundamental necessities such as healthcare or, or access to, uh, to such things. It doesn't really influence the health of the of the insured person. Um, and in this market, since we have chosen particularly life insurance because it's easier to think of this insurance based on a single outcome, being the life of a person, where health insurance or long-term care insurance have, have so many different components uh, that are related differently to, to many different disorders. And therefore, it's, it's kind of a neat example case in that sense. And, and the second reason is that it's, it's usually um, a private, insurance that is not considered uh, a necessity good, um, which is why, why the general public often consider it uh, more okay to underwrite uh, or to uh, base premiums or rejections based on observable characteristics. And just as a reminder is that in, in general, we, we model and life insurance assuming uh, that there is a symmetry of information between the life insurance applicant and the insurance company, the insurer, and that in a market with, with uh, well-functioning competition, the premiums for such an insurance, the, that is the price, should be actuarially fair. And that is kind of the basis for uh, that I come into this. Uh, then there are, of course, a range of ethical complications with rating uh, insurance contracts based on, on genetics, but I leave that out. So, so in that sense, one could see genetic information just as any other kind of medical information that is, that is normally assumed that it needs to be symmetric between the insurer and the applicant. 
The life insurance industry itself is, has expressed uh, both optimism and concern about predictive genetic testing and polygenic scores. Uh, on the upside, we could imagine that uh, with, uh, with uh, polygenic scores, genetic risk scores and genetic testing, uh, that in the, in the medium term and long term, that it could improve population health, like with precision medicine, uh, better application of, of, uh, of drugs or medicines, and, and uh, perhaps also lifestyle changes based on, on, on these results, which over time could lead to fewer death claims and, and thus a lower intensity of claims compared to the currently underwritten population. Um, in the circumstance that the life industry would be allowed to underwrite based on uh, polygenic scores or predictive genetic tests, it, it, uh, it's reasonable to assume that as these become more predictive, uh, so will also the accuracy of the underwriting process. And um, uh, insurance theory tells us that the more accurate the underwriting process is, the more accurately we can classify applicants into different risk groups and, and rate them, therefore, will lead to an uh, overall lower price for, for life insurance market-wide. Um, so those are kind of the promises. Uh, the downside of, for the insurers is the the possibility or, or the, the impossibility of, of underwriting based on, on these genetic test results. And that as consumers uh, through consumer genetic testing or through genomic medicine, uh, learn more about their uh, health risks, that they could also act upon these and, and purchase insurance or more insurance than they otherwise would have. And if this is not observable to, to, to the insurer, then this over time could lead to adverse selection, which could threaten the affordability and the viability of private life insurance uh, markets as a whole. And that is, of course, a, an extremely negative outcome that, that needs to be, be uh, diverted. Um, but before one could even consider actually including predictive genetic tests and genetic risk scores in, in actuarial models, we first need to, to, to um, provide enough evidence that, that uh, that make these tools actually justified to, to the underwriter. And uh, not too long ago, in 2014, there was an uh, international meeting conference uh, that gathered stakeholders and, and scholars. Um, and one of the major outcomes of, of this uh, conference was a call for more empirical research on the integration of uh, predictive genetic tests in life insurance models. Before we go to, to, to the study itself, I just uh, wanted to, to um, give some, some other background on, on life modern life insurance and, and uh, contemporary underwriting process. And, and again, I and others consider it essential that we use observable, observable characteristics to determine premiums and rejections for these kind of private insurance. Uh, we have ample of evidence that not doing so uh, leads to, to either extremely high insurance prices or, or complete market failure, uh, which is a worse outcome than, than otherwise. Um, when, an app, uh, when a person applies for, for a life insurance contract, if the person is older, um, it's standard to, to uh, uh, accept to have to go through a medical examination. So, um, so, so it's common that the insurer just pays a doctor or, or medically trained staff to, 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 give, a, to give a medical review of, of a person. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, in most countries, um, almost everywhere, there's a duty to disclose medical records, family history, and extensive personal information. So in that sense, life insurance companies are already entrusted with handling extremely private and sensitive information. And there are those that argue that there isn't really any reason to expect them to handle genetic information with any less prudence. But, but there are uh, exceptionalities for genetic data as well. And um, for people that are not yet at older age or that, uh, that are generally healthy, or also people at an older age who are applying for, for, for low to standard life insurance amounts, uh, these days life insurance has become such a automated fashion that, that and, and very data-driven um, 
industry that in many cases it's enough to provide a personal health declaration um, because it is costly for the uh, for the insurance company to pay for medical examination or laboratory analysis of, of uh, blood, urine, or other sorts of tissues. And, and if the insurance amounts are low enough or the applicant appear healthy enough, it's enough to use the, the privately declared information. Um, in most countries, we, it's, it's important to state that uh, it's usually forbidden either by law or uh, moratoriums or best practice in the insurance market to request an applicant to undergo genetic testing. So that occurs almost uh, nowhere. Um, but with that said, if a person through medicine has undergone diagnostic testing for genetic testing for a rare disorder, say Huntington's disease, then that, that sort of information forms part, usually part of that person's medical records and is just standard information for the uh, underwriter to, to attain. And um, in, in some countries, the, 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 I would like to state that the regulatory situation is still in flux with many trends, both in towards more permissive and towards more, more uh, restrictive stances. Um, but the ones turning more permissive, uh, it, uh, many, many countries are now implementing also a duty to disclose results from predictive genetic tests. Uh, that is what, what, what this uh, study is about um, for certain disorders or when the insurance amounts are really large, as that can signal that there is some kind of speculation going on if the insurance amount doesn't ma match the financial status of the applicant. So moving over to the present study. Uh, the aim of our study was that we wanted to quantify whether already existing genetic risk scores, which we hereafter call polygenic scores through, through convention, uh, whether those that already exist uh, could improve the classification of mortality risk in life insurance underwriting. So uh, kind of like a basic question. And in some ways, this question has already been been tackled before by Ghana, Marioni, Pilling, McTade, Timmers. I think some of these people also related to, to, to uh, work at Oxford. Uh, in their genetic studies, they have already shown that polygenic scores, uh, both for parental uh, lifespan, which is a common proxy in, in genetic studies on, on longevity, but also related polygenic scores like for education or cardiovascular disease, that these indeed predict mortality rates. Um, kind of like the, the first proof of concept that, that uh, polygenic scores indeed are important for predicting mortality risk. Um, however, uh, to date, there has been no more systematic modeling of polygenic scores in the context of life insurance. And these earlier studies, they usually only uh, adjust or condition the regressions on age and sex and, and genetic PCs as, as an important genetic control variable. Um, but but other, other, other than that, we, we, we know, of course, that polygenic scores conceptually uh, have many direct and indirect pathway from the genetic variant to the health outcomes they ultimately influence. Some of them travel through environmental components like, uh, like actually smoking or drinking or through diet. Um, and it's less clear whether uh, how well polygenic scores predict mortality rates once we start adjusting for these uh, observable factors that are already available to insurers. Um, so, so that's kind of like the, the, the outset of our study. And um, we performed a series of survival analyses and mortality risk classification by using a larger set of polygenic scores than the previous studies, and also uh, a more careful uh, selection of control variables and, and uh, incremental models. And we did it uh, with, with uh, a different sample that has not yet been used uh, in, in these previous uh, mortality predictions with PRS. Um, to, as a baseline to select our core variates, um, uh, we thought of what, what could be a relevant insurance scenario, some kind of baseline. And, and also this was led by, by data availability. There's not many data sets where you have a perfect history of someone's medical records that you, that you can simply 
model easily and, and control for in, in regression. Um, so we thought uh, that perhaps a good idea could be to do some kind of retrospective cross-section um, where we try to, to um, model the state of applicants as they, as they are at age 35, which is roughly the modal age of life insurance applicants. That means that, for example, most people in, in the sample or, or almost everyone would not have ongoing cardiovascular disease or wouldn't have, would, would maybe be the first uh, ages where, where uh, breast cancer would, would start appearing and, and stuff like that. So, so at that, we're, we're modeling an age where people are usually relatively healthy still for, for, for these kind of common medical conditions related to mortality. Um, also important to say, um, we, we um, had somewhat of an idea and, and uh, studies based on a pre-registered study protocol, which is available online. Um, we thought that to be able to thoroughly get to this question, we need a sample with um, a good age range and, and uh, enough observed events or deaths uh, and genetic data. And those kind of data sets are, are not that plenty out there. Um, and we, we, we decided to use the health and retirement study uh, also because the health and retirement study has provided, the participants have provided broad consent so that we are allowed to study also socioeconomic questions such as insurance in relation to their genetic data. Uh, and this is a, a longitudinal household survey of elderly Americans roughly between age 50 and for the rest of their lives. And it's collected biannually starting in 1992. And we had just, I believe, 16 waves of data for until 2016, 2018, or what is it, 13 waves of data. And uh, HRS started collecting genotype data, somewhat delayed. So that didn't get started until 2006. And we used uh, the, the second release of the genetic data, which has been collected between 2006 and 2010. Um, and this then means that between 1992 and 2006 is 14 years of opportunity for, uh, for, for participants to, to die from different reasons. And, and um, Dominguez and colleagues have already shown that there is indeed uh, mortality selection present in the genotype subsample of the HRS, meaning that they are healthier and longer lived than the non-genotype subsample. And uh, theory and empirics show that, that we would expect any polygenic score or any covariate um, that may have contributed to mortality selection, I'm thinking in particular polygenic scores for cardiovascular disease, um, if these people have already died or, or are underrepresented, we would expect to, to have a uh, false negative rate. So at least it, 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 uh, it leads to an understatement of the effect we're looking for rather than an overstatement in the usual case. Another benefit of the health and retirement study is that the mortality da data is of high quality and it's been validated several times, uh, latest by Weir in 2016, um, and, and judged effectively complete. And, and that's not always the case with other prospective uh, cohort samples. Um, because genome-wide association studies, what we're going to base the polygenic scores on, um, almost always have been performed in European ancestry individuals. Um, their transferability to non-Europeans is very restricted and can lead to various sorts of biases. So as is common, we restricted the sample to ge genetically determined European ancestry individuals and based on recommendations from Dominguez et al. and, and based on, on observing complete data, we also restricted the sample to individuals born in 1920 to 1955, um, which meant that we had more than 100 individuals per, per birth year at least. And in the most recent wave, roughly 25% of, of this sample was deceased, uh, and only 1.4% had left the sample uh, during the 16 years uh, due to attrition. So very low attrition compared to, to, to uh, leaving the sample due to, to, to mortality. I see maybe someone had a question there. Can I, can I get that up? Uh,
Oh, uh, I, uh, I see that someone asked about the Maxwell et al. study. Um, yes, I'm definitely aware of that study. The difference is that they uh, only focus on two polygenic scores for breast cancer and cardiovascular disease. And they also focus much more on health insurance than a focus on life insurance. And beyond their um, prediction of disease incidence, all their modeling of insurance is uh, purely theoretical and not empirical. So we differ from Maxwell et al. in a, in a series of ways. Thank you for the question. Um, since this is a seminar in, in uh, precision medicine, I would expect that most of you have come across polygenic scores. So polygenic scores are, are linear predictors of someone's DNA, where we weigh the person's genetic profile with, with uh, weights from genome-wide association studies that have searched for associations between a genetic variant and an outcome, say a medical condition. And to, to, from the universe of potential uh, medical conditions that we could model polygenic scores for, we pre-registered a particular search protocol to kind of narrow that down into, into something workable. Uh, and we focused on, on this uh, fatal common medical conditions and mortality risks. Um, and um, we had kind of pre-registered a long list of traits that, that came based on the previous work of Ghana and McDade in the same, in the same space on genetic risks and, and mortality. And Ghana et al, they had already done an expert curation of uh, diseases, disorders, and mortality health risks uh, using a panel of clinicians. And McDade had used a, a more empirical approach with a quasi-causal genetic analysis. Um, and uh, that led to a list of roughly 80, 80 medical conditions and, and, and health risks, I think. And then we searched uh, the, the GWAS catalog in the, in the March 1, 2019 version, applying a threshold that the GWAS must have included at least 100,000 people so that we avoid many small and underpowered polygenic scores. And of course, we ensure that HRS was included, excluded from all summary statistics that we used. Uh, in the end, we created polygenic scores with 13 common medical conditions and 14 mortality risks with an average N of almost 500,000. You may not have time to read the entire list, but maybe you can find your, your medical condition or, or health risk of, of interest here. Some examples are Alzheimer's disease, breast cancer, cor coronary artery disease, um, and say prostate cancer. And when it comes to mortality risks or, or predictors of, of mortality rates, we have, for example, body mass index, we're having educational attainment, we're having height, uh, and also parental lifespan. And, and here a shout out to the most recent parental lifespan study of Timmers et al. I think also maybe a, a group from Oxford contributed to that one. Uh, they, they ran the thus far largest GWAS on, on lifespan, essentially, where, where parental lives, they use offspring genotypes. But since these people are not yet deceased, we, we proxy the offspring lifespan with the parental lifespan, which, which works reasonably well. Uh, and they did that in 640,000 people or so. Um, we estimated their LD score heritabilities. Um, and we excluded any trait from, from polygenic risk scores uh, that didn't have a uh, um, significant heritability at, at I think uh, the 1% level, it was a pre-registered threshold, which means that, means that we did not generate scores for large artery stroke nor small vessel stroke. We proceeded by estimating genetic correlations and here as somewhat of a test of the, um, the relevance of each of these traits for longevity is the line with, uh, with their genetic correlation with parental lifespan. And what we see is that all but three uh, traits are significantly genetically correlated with parental lifespan um, and some of them being very strongly such as coronary artery disease any ischemic stroke or any stroke. Um, obviously, this, this kind of reflects there the, the, the mortality risks in a previous uh, population and it may change over time, uh, which is another reason why, why we, of course, need to do this in offspring and not only in parents. But we also see that other more 
behavioral, more environmental components are, are relatively strongly correlated with parental lifespan, such as educational attainment um, and uh, body mass index. Um, we started off with uh, an exploratory univariate survival analysis. So this is simply Kaplan-Meier uh, survival functions in our sample of 9,272 HRS respondents. And we, we generated polygenic scores for these traits in this population. And then uh, we had pre-registered that we would evaluate the scores by comparing the survival in the top decile uh, versus the lower nine deciles. So, uh, in our main results, we're not applying an extreme groups approach, uh, but really the top decile compared to the rest. And in the, in the first five columns, you will see the, the median lifespan in the lower nine decile compared to the top decile for respondents. Um, the delta is the difference in median between the two. And then you have the p-value of the null hypothesis that the survival rates are identical. And what we see in the respondents is that 15 out of the 27 polygenic scores uh, significantly predict the differences in median uh, lifespan um, uh, in un univariate analysis at the conventional 5% level. I, I, be I believe there are, most of them are really small. So, so changing to like Bonferroni correction doesn't really change. It's only any ischemic stroke that's really on the edge there. And a benefit of analyzing uh, maternal paternal survival instead is that we, we do not expect the same uh, mortality selection as we do in the respondent sample where the genotyping was delayed. On the other hand, we don't have covariates to control for, for a parental uh, analysis. So, so we don't do that in, in the multiple regressions later. And a second problem is of course that respondent or offspring genotypes is a noisy measure of, of parental genotypes only partially capturing it. And, and overall, we, we found that, the, or we think the, the, the pattern is largely the same with a few differences in particular uh, coronary artery disease, which is borderline not significant in respondents, maybe because it is understated for them, but highly significant in, in, the, in the maternal. And uh, the score for parental lifespan is, is really strong in the parents with a diff median lifespan difference of six years in the, in the mothers and nine years in the, in the fathers. Um, and otherwise we see that in the univariate analysis, most of the significant uh, scores per stand, uh, no, sorry, per, when we compare the top decile versus the lower nine decile can predict somewhere between one and two years difference when they're not conditioned on each other or any other covariates. Uh, which does motivate us to, to proceed with most of them or, or we actually proceeded with all of them for multivariate modeling. Uh, we then continued with uh, multi multiple regressions of respondent survival as four nested Cox proportional hazard models. Um, the hazard models the instantaneous probability of event, in our case of dying, uh, centered on a particular point in time in the, in the observation period. Um, and the, the hazard is denoted lambda, which is a function of t time and said the, the regressors or, or covariates. And the, the baseline hazard, kind of when, when all the covariates are centered, uh, models kind of like the, the population average as an intercept. And then all the, uh, and then the models model, uh, models the risk of dying as a proportional, as a proportion related to this baseline hazard uh, as a function of the covariates. Um, uh, covariates with note Z, and with alpha here, we have the vector of. Cox regression coefficients to be estimated. Um, and we break with convention here and denote these alpha because we reserved the beta for the regression coefficients from the GWAS that we use to generate polygenic scores. Um, so um, respondents were genotyped at different times points between 2006 and 2008. So we used subject specific genotyping wave as time origin. And for the longest uh, observation period, we have up to 136 months of observation. 
Um, so on the right hand side, the said we, we tested four nested specification in the presentation, I will focus on the first three. Um, and all four models included what we call the life table parameters that are, uh, that are covariates for sex, um, um, fixed effects for birth year, so not a continuous vari variable, but fixed effects, fixed effects for birth month, uh, which are also sig significant differences in, in survival based on, on uh, month of birth and age of genotyping. Uh, all these were included to just uh, try to make respondents as comparable in this regard at, at, uh, at the start of the uh, modeling period. Um, moving on from the univariate analysis, we first tested a genetics first model, which uh, apart from the, or in addition to the life table parameters included the 27 polygenic scores and 10 genetic PCs to control for possible subtle population stratification. Uh, I see a couple of questions here, clarifying questions. Are all the categorical variables binary? No, you can, you can either have them as a series of dummies uh, or you can, can model them as, as, a, as, a, as a categorical variable in regression software. The end result is the same. So, so some categoricals include uh, many categories like birth year. That's between 1920 and 1955 would just be like 35 dummies. Uh, what's in the variable of breast cancer? So I think this is only a polygenic score for breast cancer. So it's just a genetic predictor for breast cancer based on the Milaudio uh, paper from 2017. Were there any difficulties normalizing the data? Um, not sure what's meant there. So, so maybe follow up during Q&A. Going back to presentation. Um, so that's kind of like our, our basic model. And the reason for estimating model one is just to see what happens with the coefficients of the polygenic scores once we uh, condition them on the genetic PCs, which are important to avoid potential bias from, from subtle population stratification and on each other. Because of course it could be that parental lifespan captures all these other traits such as breast cancer or, or cardiovascular disease, et cetera. And, and their univariate effect is, is, uh, is less interesting maybe than their, than their multi multiple uh, adjusted effect. And then as a baseline comparison, we estimated the covariate first model, which included the life table parameters and then a series of observable underwriting factors, which I will present to you soon. Um, and thereafter, we estimated a combined model three, which is fully nested in the sense that combined model three adds the polygenic scores to the covariates or vice versa adds the covariates to the polygenic scores. And this is the model we use for mortality risk classification later um, to evaluate uh, uh, conditional on this baseline that is already observable to ensure uh, how much more can we predict when we add the polygenic scores. And then we had a robustness model that I uh, won't give more details on that. No. Um, so in modern underwriting, um, an underwriter first collects all of these different medical conditions, medical information, and use those to assign a risk class to a respondent. Once this risk class has been decided, say plus 200% relative mortality, then the underwriter goes to a life table um, that has different parameters to choose, so that needs to be set, and those are sex uh, and birth year. Uh, and age. And that's why we're separating these covariates from the demographic and the medical underwriting factors because they are used in different ways by the underwriter. Um, and therefore we feel that the, the relevant comparison for polygenic scores is not to, to these uh, life table parameters, but to the actual underwriting factors that separate people into different risk classes. Um, with the data in the HRS, we define the following demographic underwriting factors like marital, marital status, uh, job with longest tenure, ever active military service, drinking, smoking, BMI were the only lifestyle measures that we modeled. Uh, medical underwriting factors included maternal, paternal mortality, self-rated health, um, childhood disability for a longer time, important or serious health problem in childhood, 
and observed di diabetes diagnosis by age 35. So we merged childhood and young adult with diabetes. And this was the uh, in HRS, they collect data on roughly eight or nine major uh, medical conditions, including Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, um, some measures of pain, etc. But diabetes uh, was the only such medical conditions where we actually observed any respondent having a diagnosis by age 35. And um, this is kind of what we could gather with the available data that we think roughly represents a personal health declaration for an applicant that does not have, an, uh, have a particularly alarming medical or family history. Uh, on the other hand, um, so, so it's kind of, it gives a, an incremental view on how much polygenic scores can, can add to the model. Um, but on the other hand, this is a situation where we could also believe that an underwriter really, really wants to have access to genetic data. When there are no other risks to observe, then of course you start wondering what could be found under the hood, so to speak. Um, it's a lot of information, but this uh, table shows the first three models. First, the genetics first model, and then the column thereafter, the covariate first model, and thereafter, the combined model. The genetics first model, I believe, found nine significant polygenic scores uh, at the at the, and to, yeah nine significant polygenic scores at the conventional level. Um, a positive alpha here means that a polygenic score is associated or an uh, any variable is associated with an increased mortality risk. And we can see that the, the parental lifespan has the uh, expected opposite sign because higher score is associated with longer lifespan and just lower mortality risk. And the same thing applies to educational attainment. Um, and the effect size for parental lifespan was the largest of any of the polygenic scores. So uh, the G was by Timmers et al. They, it really captures uh, lots of information and was, was well performed. Um, but if we compare that, for example, with the coefficient of, of sex, I don't know if you see my mouse, but a little bit further down in, uh, you have the coefficient for sex, uh, male, female has a, has a much stronger effect. Uh, here we're talking that parental lifespan has a relative mortality of a roughly 10% difference. And I think male, female is roughly a 40% lower relative mortality rate for, for women. We find in the covariate first model that many of the selected covariates here is only a selection of, of the, uh, to fit the table, um, significantly predicted co uh, mortality rates in the expected direction. And we can see that the, the coefficient of parental lifespan in the genetics first model is about twice the size of an extra year of education, um, roughly uh, and roughly the same as, or sorry, roughly the same as paternal mortality by age 65, and uh, roughly three times than an additional unit of BMI. Uh, so, so that's per standard deviation of polygenic score, which means that the effect sizes of any individual polygenic score should be considered small compared to the observables. This is expected because we're uh, having, having a noisy estimate of the true genetic risk. Um, then we condition the models on uh, or set of regressors on each other. And in the, in the combined model, uh, we see that we only have uh, four uh, significant scores at 5% level uh, remaining Alzheimer's disease, cigarettes per day, height, uh, sorry, height and parental lifespan. And then we have some, some marginally non-significant results that used to be significant, like type 2 diabetes, which we're now actively controlling for in the model. Um, and uh, depression was not, yeah, depression was significant before, uh, and breast cancer is now marginal in, in, in the adjusted model. Um, at the, in the absolute bottom panel, we can also look, we're, we're going to proceed, so since the effect of any particular polygenic score is small, in the, on the following slide, we're going to combine them to test their combined effect. And what the bottom panel shows here is that we're, we're, we're kind of comparing four non-overlapping sets of regressors, being the polygenic scores, the genetic PCs, the demographic and medical uh, underwriting factors here addressed as COVAR, and then the life table parameters, sex, age, genotype, and birth year and birth month. And across all of the model, the life table parameters explain the most 
uh, and, and substantially more than any other set of regressors, roughly 30, uh, roughly a third of the variation in mortality. And we can see that the polygenic scores together uh, before being conditioned on the underwriting factors explain roughly 2.1% of the variation in mortality and slightly less once adjusted, meaning that some of their signal was indeed removed by, the, uh, by adding the uh, observables already available to insurers. The genetic PCs in basically always explain zero and, and uh, in, the, in the once region of residence was controlled for, there was no effect of, of genetic PCs anymore. And uh, the demographic and medical factors together explain roughly 10% of the variation. Uh, I see a comment, although the PRS for parental lifespan is significant and paternal mortality is not, in fact, the parameter estimates of both are very similar. Um, I, be oh, I believe the, yeah. So what we see is that uh, paternal mortality is indeed uh, significant at the conventional level before being adjusted for polygenic scores and the effect of paternal mortality drops to roughly about half and uh, yeah, the parental lifespan score roughly to half as well. Um, and the way we could see this, right, this paternal mortality is kind of like a, a noisy binary variable here um, that, we, that was observed indeed by most people at 35, while the parental lifespan score, of course, captures a continuous distribution of risk instead. I uh, have to just speed up a little bit, but we're almost at, at the core result. So we, we took the results of the Cox models to generate hazard indexes on the log hazard scale for these four non-overlapping regressor sets that I just introduced uh, with the intent of comparing their relative share of variance explained. What I just shown that the life table parameters capture roughly a third of the variation, the underwriting factors 10% and the polygenic scores with 2%, which is small, but still meaningful. Um, but we then wanted to compare, uh, we wanted to use the polygenic scores in combination to classify mortality risk and then compare that capacity to that of the demographic and medical underwriting factors. Um, so we followed an approach uh, proposed by Rolleston and Altman to, to generate linear predictors of a particular Cox model, um, which to you of you more, more um, uh, who know polygenic scores uh, is basically the same same formula as generating polygenic scores, but now we're, we're taking the alphas, the regre regression coefficients from the Cox models to weigh the different polygenic scores into a sum index that we hear called hazard index for PGS. And we follow the same approach for, for the PCs, the life table parameters and uh, demographic and medical underwriting factors, which means that we're getting yeah, four hazard indexes for, for each Cox model that we can compare. And here we're starting by taking the hazard index for the demographic and the medical covariates. And again, we're evaluating this uh, in the sample for using the same pre-registered threshold, comparing the top 10% with the, with the lower 90% of the distribution of this hazard index. So we, when we combine these covariates that together explain roughly 10% of the variation in mortality, and we classify mortality risk with, uh, yeah, uh, conventional Kaplan-Meier analysis, uh, we can see that this stratification discerns roughly 8.1 years difference in median lifespan. So that is kind of our baseline, what we can do with these covariates. And then we, and this is based on, on model two before the covariates were, were adjusted for the polygenic scores. Uh, and then we did the same thing for, for model three, where the underwriting factors and the polygenic scores are adjusted for each other. Uh, where we start with, again, classifying risk based on the top 10% of hazard index for, uh, for the underwriting factors. But then we do, we add a two-way combination also of the top 10% of the hazard index for high PGS. And the graph that you just saw would in this graph be represented by the difference between points A and B. And by doing so, we actually find the same 8.1 year difference. And what do the polygenic scores then add? Yeah, polygenic scores then add the difference between A and A stripe and B and B stripe. 
um, which in both cases is a 2.6 year difference in median lifespan. So this is kind of the core result of our paper that adding polygenic scores to this uh, more developed model uh, for an insurance underwriter can discern an additional 2.6 year difference in median lifespan. And that you can see here in the middle panel, marked with a star, that's the, the central comparison in panel C. And before, ad, before adjusting the, the uh, polygenic scores for the covariates in the top panel, you can see that the top decile of, of the, uh, sorry, it's, uh, I'm, I'm missing a column here. But anyways, in the top panel is for the polygenic hazard index, which in itself could uh, identify a 4.6 year difference in median lifespan before being adjusted for the covariates. So it's just important to, to, to think for an insurer what other information do they have available that is simultaneously captured by the polygenic score. We compare this 2.6 year difference with some other uh, observed factors uh, on their own. And then once we combine the polygenic scores, they are very similar to uh, uh, classifying uh, mortality risk as sex, which in our sample uh, discerned a 2.8 year difference in median lifespan between male men and women. And it's also very similar to former smoking, which in our sample was 2.5 year difference, um, but not yet as strong as being in the top decile BMI, which in this sample is roughly a BMI greater than 37 or so. So relatively, relatively overweight to this, uh, which is a 4.4 year difference and current smoking with uh, a whooping 10 year difference in median lifespan for, for those in the sample still smoking. Uh, so in essence, when combined PGS are just on par with a couple of already established underwriting factors. Uh, we found we generated cumulative mortality rates and found that for a life turning 60, 70 or 80, there is an extra 35 to 67% higher mortality risk uh, for those in the top decile of the polygenic hazard index. And this estimate is hovering around the first substandard risk class used in, in life insurance, which is roughly at plus 25 to 75% extra relative mortality. You may have noticed that we evaluated the polygenic hazard index in the same sample as we estimated the Cox coefficients, um, which could have led to overfitting. On the other hand, we didn't estimate so many parameters, uh, so, so shouldn't be that much of a problem. Um, but nonetheless, we split the sample 65-45% uh, and performed a cross-validation with 1,000 iterations. And uh, to summarize, the suggest of the cross-validation suggests that the uh, general, uh, our main result is overall robust to overfitting. Uh, David Curtis has a, has a good point. I suppose that PGS would be even more useful for underwriting if it was taken as a quantitative measure, not just a top decile versus the other nine. Um, that is absolutely right. Uh, any kind of dichotomization of the, of the uh, continuous distribution of the PGS uh, will lead to, to thresholding effects and, and uh, essentially noise because you're removing information, right? Uh, nonetheless, we should remember that underwriting is still classical in the sense that they are using dichotomized categories where usually it is the top 10%, top 5%, top of course, varies for, for different companies. But we, we, we followed an approach that is not that dissimilar from, from actual practices. But I, I agree with David Curry's comment that we are removing information by dichotomizing. So, in conclusion, um, we have shown the polygenic scores can now be combined, classify mortality risk to a similar degree as already established insurance risk factors. In, in our preferred model, uh, we identify a 2.6 year difference in median lifespan when they are combined. Um, reminder to the audience that this is, of course, a lower bound. We already know that larger GWAS will come, become available and we can already project the predictive accuracy that these will have in the near future. Um, so we expect that this result will only be valid for like today and, and will then be outdated. But it's, it's, a, it's our first uh, step of, of kind of showing the relevance of polygenic scores to, the, to, uh, to um, some of the, the econ literature. And, and um, polygenic scores, sure, their predictive capacity is reduced when we control for other factors, but genetic testing, predictive genetic testing has many other advantages, such that they can be revealed much earlier in life than, than, than uh, any signs or symptoms of actual diseases or disorders. 
Um, we think our results lend some support that adverse selection could intensify under the assumption that insurers will not be allowed to take this information into account or request it. Uh, but we also agree that it's very ethically, ethically problematic to start underwriting already based on predictive genetic tests. Um, there are some that where the pathways are not clear. Uh, how should you rate someone based on a polygenic score for never smoke uh, for for smoking in, uh, for cigarettes per day? Uh, that may be a never smoker and and other such uh, questions. But we we would need to um, us, uh, consult our bio ethicists uh, there to help us develop that. And of course, over time, real evidence-based risk classes would have to be developed before this could ever be, be put into an underwriting practice. Um, since we think that genetic testing may negatively influence insurance behavior, say that someone gets told by, by one of these low accuracy tests that someone has a, a great chance of living long um, and, and therefore may faultily terminate a life insurance contract to their demise. We, we think it's a reasonable policy recommendation to consider genetic testing for any kind of disease or disorder to be a form of counseling. And we know that, that um, worldwide uh, standards for genetic counseling are still in development, but we would like to see this uh, becoming more relevant and more applied to, to the consumer genetic side of things, uh, which on the other hand may require uh, internationally uh, international agreements between jurisdictions to actually be feasible. I would like to acknowledge some, some, uh, some people for their uh, contributions uh, to our funding sources, uh, that we had eth ethics approval, and of course, uh, my, my thanks to all the researchers and research participants that contributed to the public dissemination of the GWAS summary statistics I used, and the respondents of the HRS for making this study possible. Thank you so much for your attention. Richard, thank you. That was a really a fantastic talk. And as you said at the beginning, this is, um, <clears throat> it's a new world we're entering into. It's great that we have um, such good research to help, help us understand these questions. So we've got about four minutes left for some uh, questions and a few have come through in the chat. Um, so I'll just put these to you. Um, so, um, there's a distinction between uh, diagnostic tests, such as for hunting disease and say PRS for breast cancer, uh, where it adds very little to predictiveness given family history, for example. Um, <clears throat> and would you imagine that any duty to disclose must depend on how predictive the polygenic risk score is? I, I got the first part, but could you just repeat the questions? It was hard so to the, hear. the question is whether any duty to disclose um, the results of a polygenic risk score that isn't should that, should that duty depend on how predictive the polygenic risk score is? That's a very good question. And there are no, actually no standards, best practices, or, or even norms or conventions there yet, right? Um, so so uh, I think that pertains to our comment here that much more research is needed to, to kind of develop evidence-based risk classes and see when this would make sense and, and such. Um, but it's, it's a reminder that in many jurisdictions, no matter if this is predictive or not, insurers could legally ask for it uh, as long as the insurance amount passes a certain threshold uh, or so, uh, as soon as it, they can motivate it uh, actuarially. And then it is true that, that uh, much of this information is captured in family history, but family history is also a very noisy predictor of someone's common medical risks, right? We have cardiovascular disease in where, where no other family member has it and, and, and vice versa, a person not getting breast cancer in a family where most people are having uh, our cases. And, and here, genetic predictions can of course help us separate between these if, if they become uh, more, more predictable. And we have the case of adoptees, right? Where, where the, the biological family is not necessarily known where, where this could also be interesting for insurers. Sure. And a couple of other questions have come up in the Q&A, if you can see those, uh, I'd like to. Um, yeah, so uh, David comments, it doesn't seem sustainable that consumers will have this information, but insurance companies will not. How long can the situation continue? Um, I think I, I must agree there uh, with, with David that it is not sustainable. And uh, for now, there isn't much evidence that people indeed change their insurance behavior based on this information. I think most people 
that get this information also feel it's not predictable enough for me to make drastic changes. Um, so so I, I wouldn't say, and there is no evidence now that insurance are under uh, selection, intensified selection pressure based on this. Um, so I, I think we, we will have to um, have a discussion ongoing as evidence uh, gathers and, and have to reevaluate as we can show that people indeed have much private information on health risks. Um, Bill has some questions on the modeling based on all the variables available to you. How many groups can you divide the patients into from these groups? Can you build classifiers to score people outside of your data sets? Um, definitely the, the hazard indices that we generated within our own data set are, are transferable. Um, that's actually the, the basis of, of this approach that you, you estimate a Cox model in one sample, and then you test its out of sample predictive capacity by not running another Cox model in the second sample, but by transferring the weights and generating these indexes. So, so this, is, this is definitely doable. Um, the number of groups uh, open to, to imagination, we, we kind of follow the, the insurance tradition that has a standard set and only one extreme tail is the, is the risk high risk group. Um, uh, Bill also asked, what's the prediction accuracy in the conventional insurance practice, more specific life insurance? How much can your method improve the prediction accuracy? Um, yeah, so, so based on our results, say that you have an, have a, have an individual that is otherwise of average risk, like uh, uh, maybe say female, then low risk, and then not smoker, not drinker, very much so average risk. Uh, but would have a very high value for, for various of the cancer cardiovascular scores that we have here. Um, we think we have shown that, that we are just now on the border where it would make sense based on current insurance practices to rate such a person as substandard based on high polygenic load. Um, and with our current results, yeah, the accuracy, we don't, we don't have a measure beyond the additional 2.6 year difference that we can, can, can apply. And, and uh, individual prediction is not yet accurate at all, but the individual prediction is also not the job of an underwriter. For example, there are many women who, who live shorter than many men, but still we, we separate the female and male applicants simply based on the mean differences. And, and the, same, the same reasoning would, would apply here. We, the underwriter actually doesn't care about any one individual. He just cares about the, the overall, overall distribution of risk classes and getting those more accurate than, than a baseline. Thanks, Richard. There was another question in the chat if you if you have time. Um, for, yeah, yeah. So the, the remark is that parental lifespan in the past would have been more affected by infectious diseases than today, and that might be unlikely to influence the risk of the children. Um, and how much do you think that my family history of particular disease is there for any good at predicting my lifespan? Um, as any polygenic risk score that I might have. Uh, yeah, so infectious diseases is interesting, right? Because it's kind of a combination of genetic risk and environmental risk. If the infectious disease pathogen would never be in your environment, you wouldn't get the disease, right? But on the other hand, your, your immune system is genetically determined. So there's a genetic component to uh, exposure and, and, and getting the disease uh, upon exposure, right? And uh, therefore, I believe that the parental lifespan score would indeed capture uh, infectious diseases through whatever effects they relate to immune system. Um, but on the other hand, um, nonetheless, most, most of the mortality burden in, in the US where, where the, the parental lifespan here is from in, uh, I would say, uh, is still from non-communicable diseases, uh, although this has changed. What that would mean in practice, though, is that say that you would use the parental lifespan score and now actually in these parents do the same analysis as I did, you would have a larger effect because you would capture that part. But if, if that part of the polygenic score doesn't correlate with the offspring uh, mortality, then that just reduces the effect size of the parental lifespan score. So, so to that sense, it, it, uh, it just explains what overlaps and it doesn't explain what doesn't overlap. And I, I think for, very quickly, uh, just before Zoom uh, kicks us out, uh, I think Bill has one question. Um, if you could just answer that in, in one minute before we thank you for your yeah. 
So Do you think we will use single cell or RNA seq data in such practice in the future when the data is more abundant? Um, all honesty, not my expertise. Um, and I believe, based on uh, what I do know is that you can probably generate much better biomarkers for certain disorders you, using uh, single cell or, or RNA sequencing. Uh, on the other hand, that would probably mean that, that temporally you are, are at a different stage than polygenic scores because you wouldn't be able to take the, 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 an RNA sequence of a newborn and predict his cardiovascular disease risk 60 years in the future, which you could with polygenic scores, is my reasoning. Um, th that's fantastic. Thank you for everyone uh, for those really um, interesting and comprehensive questions. And a special thanks to you, Richard, of course. That was a fantastic talk. Thank uh, you. And thank you for we'll you back in, uh, We'll get you back in a couple of years uh, when this is developed even more. And um, people will be wishing they, they listened to this talk that you gave today. So th thank you again. And we really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for joining you. Um, thank you. Thank you.